eu estou ouvindo algum barulhinho aí estranho. Continua ouvindo, Mari? Não. Estou ouvindo. Parece uma furadeira, uma Isso. reforma, algo assim. Isso. Deixa eu ver se é desse computador. Espera aí que eu vou pegar um fone. Nós estamos ao vivo agora. Mari. Oi, Sagori. Seja bem-vindo. Bem? Tudo bem. Deixa eu tirar uma dúvida contigo rapidinho. É todo em inglês ou inglês e português? Então, eu vou... A Fernanda vai fazer uma abertura em português e aí uhum. eu vou começar a falar inglês, passo a palavra para a Marcha, vai falar inglês e uhum. aí eu vou tentar manter o inglês, a menos que eu perceba algum pânico aqui entre os alunos. Né? Geralmente, no finalzinho, eu volto e falo português também. Então, Mas... quando a gente for perguntar para ela, eu posso fazer em português e depois faço em inglês. Sim, pode ser. Tá, pode ser? É isso ah, tá para facilitar também para os seus alunos, né? é... para os meus também. Pronto. Eu pedi a ela para falar devagar, porque os alunos têm diferentes níveis né? de, de inglês, então... Eu vou fazer assim, depois que ela falar, eu vou passar a palavra para a Débora, depois você, tá agora, e aí por último o Vladimir, tá bom? Aí a gente se apresenta ou já fala alguma coisa? Se apresenta. Você, você pode se apresentar também, apesar de que na, eu vou apresentar a Marcha, eu vou falar também da presença de vocês, mas tá. você pode se apresentar também e aí... A eu vou seguir a Fernanda, você. então. <risos> que honra tê-la aqui, viu? A Ufiba é um lugar... Bom, obrigado pelo convite, Mora no viu, meu coração, eu te agradeço. E amanhã juntos de novo. Amanhã juntos de novo. Fernanda, agora ficamos por sua conta. Quando você quiser, fique à vontade. Um, good, after, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you in this afternoon. Uh, now, I will speak Portuguese. Sorry about my poor English. Um, muito boa tarde a todos. É uma alegria imensa poder fazer parte é, dessa bancada de professores tão renomados que a professora Mariana, todas as tardes de quarta-feira, nos brinda. É, gostaria, inicialmente, de cumprimentar todos os nossos colegas da banca aqui. Digo é, que, apesar da distância que estamos de forma online, a gente se sente muito próximos é, com, esse, com esse novo modelo do programa de pós-graduação em Direito, Mestrado e Doutorado da Unimar. Quero cumprimentar, então, a nossa convidada, ilustre convidada, que traz, então, a internacionalização para o nosso programa, a professora Marcha. Um, um prazer tê-la conosco aqui. Também quero cumprimentar é, os nossos convidados externos, professora Débora, é, da PUC São Paulo, também quero com, cumprimentar o professor Tagore Trajano, é, da Universidade Federal da Bahia, que tão 
tão próximo é, está da nossa querida Mariana. E também é, cumprimentar meu amigo, se assim posso chamar, nosso querido professor Vladimir, que honra é, poder estar contigo nessa tarde. É, cumprimentar também com igual carinho nossa querida Sinara, que nos acompanha assiduamente aqui no Zoom às quartas-feiras, e especialmente a professora Mariana, desde já agradecer o convite, e é, não posso deixar de destacar o brilhantismo é, desse projeto que Mariana tem trazido para a pós-graduação em Direito da Universidade de Marília. Que honra, que alegria poder realmente ver um diálogo de tamanha importância em especial de tamanha internacionalização. É, das coisas boas que a pandemia tem nos proporcionado, se é assim que eu posso dizer, sem dúvida nenhuma, é, a pós-graduação, especialmente a virtualização dessas atividades, é, sem dúvida nenhuma, fica no um saldo positivo de uma pandemia que tem aí mudado tanto as nossas rotinas. Mais uma vez, eu desejo uma excelente tarde a todos, um debate muito construtivo. Uh, professora March, sinta-se em casa. Uh, realmente, a Universidade de Marília uh, sente-se muito honrada de tê-la em nossa instituição e que, muito breve, a gente possa, de fato, fazer um encontro presencial. Quem sabe uh, a professora nos dá a, a honra, a visita ilustre na nossa instituição, mas com certeza também nós poderemos ir até aí, né Mari? A gente não, não vai se importar não de encontrá-la aí no seu estado, sem dúvida nenhuma. É, e aí agora eu gostaria de passar a palavra para a professora Mariana, para ela fazer então o, uh, uh, o encaminhamento dos debates. Muito obrigada. Obrigada, Fernanda. É uma honra às quartas-feiras ter a sua presença na abertura desse evento. É, suas palavras sempre tão gentis, tão humanas, lindas palavras, como a pessoa que você é. Me orgulha muito estar nessa universidade sob a sua direção. Eu peço licença a todos para começar a falar em inglês, para que a nossa convidada se sinta né, é, prestigiada. So, good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear students, for those who do not, don't know me yet, my name is Mariana Santiago. I am professor of the master's degree and a doctorate in law at the University of Marília. I hope you all are, are well and safe in these difficult times that we are living. We will start now our weekly events titled Dialogues on Development, Company and Society. It's an event organized by University of Marília, but now it's completely open to all the law community. So welcome everybody. It's a pleasure today to have with us a friend, my friend, Marcia Mutri. She is a retired city attorney of Santa Monica and she's very famous for having working in cases of great repercussion in the United States against all oil firms. Her lecture will be about the history of the rights of nature movement in the United States. Uh, the subject is extremely current and it's in line with what we work at the University of Marília, especially in my classes. Uh, I met Marcia in New York one year ago because of the United Nations project called Harmony with Nature, and my students already know what it is, uh, and she stay in touch, and we stay in touch, and I made that an invitation, and I'm very glad that Marsha accepted it, like us. Uh, I would like to mention the presence today of Professor Deborah Mamba from Catholic University of Sao Paulo, one of the most important universities of Brazil, and Professor Vladimir Silveira from the same university, and uh, Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul, too. We can't forget it. And Professor Taguari Trajano from Federal, Federal University of Bahia. They will discuss the topic with us in a dialogue. It should be a dialogue. Thank you, professors, my friends. 
I have to, to say thank, thank you to Professor Marielina Diniz from Catholic University of Sao Paulo and her International Law Institute for all the support to this event and for me personally. And so finally, uh, I wish everyone a great experience today and Masha, feel free to start your lecture when you want. We look forward to hearing you. Thank you once again. Thank you. I am so happy and honored to be with you all today. And I hope that we can all speak together, which I think would be much more interesting to everyone than me just talking to you. I hope that you and all of your families are well and safe during this very sad time, which has been especially sad for both of our countries, for both Brazil and for the United States. I so hope that all people can learn from this experience that we are all one and that we are connected to one another and to the natural world. But it is a hard way to learn that lesson. And I especially hope that it can be learned in my country, which has been resistant to learning that lesson. As Mariana mentioned, she and I met at um, an Earth Day gathering, a Mother Earth Day gathering at the United Nations headquarters in New York. I was invited to attend as a panelist, so was Professor Mariana, but I was invited because I was the city attorney of Santa Monica for 22 years. And during that time, my job included uh, writing and reviewing all of the laws that the city adopted, that the city council adopted. That included the law that Santa Monica adopted, which recognized the rights of both humans and natural communities to a sustainable environment. That law is the city of Santa Monica's rights of nature law. I also had responsibility during my time as city attorney for all of the city's litigation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. In general, I want to share with you some thoughts and ideas about how the US, the United States legal system protects nature and how it fails to protect nature. I will do that by sharing with you examples from three cases, because I think stories are a more interesting way to learn than lectures are. At least I am not a good lecturer, so I will try today to be a good storyteller. I will talk about two different kinds of laws in the US. We have traditional environmental protection laws we have had those for 50 years in the United States. But more recently, people in the United States have joined the international effort to change the legal paradigm and to recognize nature as also being the subject of rights, to recognize nature as having rights. This is part of the effort to increase human life in harmony with nature and to generate greater respect for nature, which of course we must do to survive. So I will tell you these three stories. And in addition, I will offer some thoughts about what's happening in the US right now in terms of developing greater respect for nature and uh, some ideas about how those efforts are working and will continue to work or not. So my first story begins in Santa Monica in 1996. 
But before I start that story, Mariana, let me ask you, am I speaking slowly enough? Thank you very much. I, listening to all of you speak earlier, you all speak very rapidly, and so do I ordinarily. So this is awkward for me because this isn't how I talk, but it is so important with, to me to be able to connect with you today. I wish I were connecting with you in person in Brazil rather than from my living room, but this is very good. We have been in isolation for months here and it is very good to be with other people. So thank you again, Mariana, for that. Back to my first story. This begins in Santa Monica in 1996. At that time, I had been the city's appointed city attorney for two years. I had been an attorney for 25 years, but I was new in my job. I loved the job, but it was difficult and I still had much to learn. And as this story begins, my job was about to get much more difficult. So I was sitting at my desk when two of my colleagues burst into my office. This was very unusual. They looked uh, distressed. They even looked a little afraid. One of them was Joe Lawrence, the assistant city attorney. Joe said to me, Marsha, we have an emergency. Our water wells are contaminated. We must shut them down. This was a big emergency. The health of the people of Santa Monica could be in danger if our wells were contaminated. So it was a health emergency. I also thought it's probably also an economic emergency. Water is scarce and very expensive in Southern California. You have a great deal of water in Brazil. We do not in California. I knew that we would have to buy water, more water, if the wells closed. The wells supplied over half our water. I asked how much it would cost to replace that water with purchased water. The assistant city attorney Joe and his colleague Craig told me it would cost $3 million a year to buy the additional water. So it was a financial emergency. And also I knew that the city council would consider it a political emergency. Santa Monica is known for its reputation uh, for environmental stewardship. So allowing our wells to become polluted would be seen as a failure by the city. But before I continue my story about what happened to Santa Monica, I must tell you a little more about water in Southern California. I don't know how many of you who are participating this morning have been to Southern California. I hope some of you have. Probably you have all seen pictures. And what the pictures show you is waving palm trees, and they show you golf courses and beautiful gardens, farmlands, fruit orchards. All of that is not natural. That is an illusion about the place, which we can create because we import so much water. The water that makes life in Southern California possible comes from the northern part of California, which is much wetter. And about half of it comes from out of state, from the Colorado River. So we are dependent upon using water from other places to support Southern California. California has a huge economy, as you, you may know. If if California was a country, it would have the fifth largest economy in the world. The economy is valued at $2.6 trillion per year. It has massive development along the coast. Most of the 24 million people who live in Southern California live along the Southern California coast. But most of Southern California is a desert. To the east of Los Angeles is the, is the Mojave Desert, 
which is the driest place in North America. The average rainfall there is five inches per year, 13 centimeters. The coast where Santa Monica is, is a Mediterranean climate. Uh, the average rainfall there is 13 centimeters a year, five inches. I am told that the coast of Southern California is very like much of the coast of Chile. So it is very dry. So the 24 million people who live in Southern California and the state's huge economy, all of that, our economic success is based on importing water. We simply don't have enough. And as, you know, as everyone knows, Earth is becoming hotter. Droughts are becoming more common, especially in the American West and especially in California. So to have water wells in Southern California, as Santa Monica does, is extremely rare. The wells are a treasure. It is almost impossible to value them. And in 1996, when Joe and Craig came into my office and said, we have an emergency, the water wells were the city's most valuable asset. And that asset had become poisoned and not usable by the city. I asked Joe and Craig how we had found out that the wells were contaminated. They told me that the city's chemist, who routinely checked the water quality, had found a compound, a chemical compound in the water that she did not recognize. So she sent it to a lab, a laboratory for analysis. And the laboratory told her it was MTBE. MTBE, I have to read this, methyl tertiary butyl ether is a gasoline additive. It is added to gasoline to make combustion more complete and therefore clean the air. But in 1996, when I was told that MTBE was poisoning the wells, I had never heard of it. Joe and Craig had never heard of it. The chemist had never heard of it. But they told me that MTBE was manufactured by oil companies as a gasoline additive. So when I learned that MTBE was a product made by the oil companies to be added to gas, I knew we had a huge legal problem because the oil company's product had contaminated our wells. So we would need to hold the oil companies accountable for that. And I knew that they would not voluntarily correct this situation. I had litigated against the Shell Oil Company years earlier, and so I knew what it was like to take oil companies to court in the United States. Consider litigating a case against the oil companies. They have such power and they have unlimited resources. That makes it very difficult. So I knew this was indeed an emergency and a very difficult problem. Joe and Craig and I talked about what we could do. It was obvious that we were going to need help. Santa Monica is a fortunate city, is wealthy, but no one is as wealthy as the oil companies and ability to litigate successfully in the United States depends unfortunately upon uh, the availability of resources, financial resources. It's very expensive. So we knew we needed help, but who could help us? Who would have the huge amount of resources necessary to help us? Well, there was only one entity that had that many resources, <laughs> and that was the federal and state governments. So we had to turn to them. 
as you know, the United, in the United States, the environment is protected by many, many federal laws and regulations. How well those work to protect the environment is a different matter, but they are there to protect the environment to a degree. Those laws were adopted 50 years ago, most of them. They're implemented by an extensive system of regulations, which is administered by the Environmental Protection Agency, which we call the EPA. So we knew that we would have to reach out to the EPA for help, as well as to the local water control agencies. But we learned that it was the EPA which had approved and later required the addition of MTBE to gasoline. In fact, the EPA had done so with much celebration because MTBE was, they believed, going to solve the air pollution problems in California. MTBE was extensively tested before it was used as a gasoline additive, but it was only tested in the air. It was not tested as something that humans drink. The EPA had apparently never considered that it might leak into water wells. They should have considered that, but they didn't. In 1996, so in 1996, the EPA was supporting the use of MTBE in gasoline. The state of California had not yet begun to regulate MTBE, but they were aware that it might get into drinking water. And so they had set a standard for what would be dangerous or what could be dangerous. And the standard they set was 35 parts per billion. When we closed the wells in Santa Monica, the concentration level was 600 parts per billion. 35, 600. It was certainly an emergency. So what could we do? We, arrange, we closed the wells that were contaminated. We began hiring experts to figure out how the MTB had gotten into our water, we asked the government for help. As to how the MTBE got into our water wells, we learned that um, underground storage tanks and pipelines, they all leak eventually, eventually. And that's why the oil companies in most countries are required to monitor them. In 1996, our, expert found, our experts found out that there were 26 gas stations, gasoline stations within two miles of our well field. And there were two major gasoline pipelines within 100 feet of our well fields. So there were many ways that the gasoline could have gotten into our water. When the well field was first acquired by the city, which was a hundred years ago, all of that land was farmland. But now it was a very dense, dense urban area. The farm fields were long gone from Western Los Angeles. So we knew that there were many ways, many tanks could have leaked, two pipes could have leaked. There were many ways that the MTBE could have gotten into our wells. The government regulators did not want to help us at first, because, as you would expect, the EPA did not want to admit its mistake in not foreseeing that MTBE would leak into drinking water. But ultimately, they agreed to help us. The EPA and the Regional Water Control Board both have the power to do many things. One of the things they can do is issue orders. And so the EPA issued orders to the oil companies, to eight oil companies, to begin buying water for us to replace uh, the water that we could not use from our wells. 
So that cost, the $3 million a year, was very quickly covered by the oil companies because of the EPA order. The, the EPA also had the power to resolve disputes. It could conduct administrative proceedings to try to resolve disputes. So the EPA began an administrative proceeding that was a negotiation between Santa Monica and the oil companies. Uh, that went on for several years and was very memorable. I went to a number of the sessions myself. The oil company was, oil companies were represented by a huge group of attorneys. This was a room full of oil company attorneys in very expensive suits. They were very good lawyers. They spoke very well and they were adamant that the well contamination was not their responsibility. And even if it was their responsibility, they said they had fulfilled their obligation to the city by buying us replacement water. So even if this was their problem and they said it wasn't, they'd solve the problem for us. We didn't need to be talking to them. At, <laughs> at one of those uh, meetings, one of my uh, colleagues ask one of the oil company representatives if he would drink a glass of the water from our contaminated well. And to my surprise, he had a bottle of that water with him and he handed it to the oil company executive and said, would you drink this? My colleague did that because the oil company had all oil companies said, that MTBE was not dangerous to humans. And it wasn't certain that it was. Some scientists said it was, some scientists said it wasn't, but I will tell you the oil company executive would not drink it. So these negotiations went on and did not produce a result that the city wanted. We wanted the aquifer cleaned, we wanted our wells back, because Santa Monica was basically on the edge of a desert and water was only going to get harder and harder to obtain. So the whales were worth a fortune and we wanted that fortune, not the water bought by the oil company. Finally, it became apparent that we would have to sue the oil companies to get what we wanted from them. Ah how to do that. Santa Monica's uh, city attorney's office is large. There are 22 lawyers in the office, which is very large for a city of 90,000. But the lawyers were busy with the city's usual work. I knew that they couldn't work on the case and they didn't have the right expertise to handle the case. So Joe and I went looking for attorneys who would know how to handle this case with us. At that time, and, and now by now we are in the year of 1999, there were very few lawyers in the US who had even, who even knew what MTBE was, much less had gone to court about MTBE. But we found the lawyers that had done that. There were three of them, we hired all of them. Thankfully, the council approved spending significant amounts at the start to get this case begun in court. So we hired experienced lawyers and in the year 2000, Santa Monica filed a lawsuit against eight oil companies and two pipeline companies. We filed that suit in state court. As you know, in the US, we have a federal court system and a state court system. It was better for us to file in state court. Had we filed in federal court, the case would have been thrown out because federally the EPA had jurisdiction. So we filed in state court because that was the court we could go to. We filed 
claiming violations of laws that protect against the contamination of water wells, laws regulating the storage of hazardous chemicals, consumer protection laws that require the disclosure of hazards. The oil companies and their huge groups of attorneys fought long, they fought well, they filed endless motions to delay the case. They did not want us to get to trial. In the US legal system, in our courts, it is very easy to delay. And very often, cases are won simply by delaying. If you delay long enough and make the other side spend enough money, they may give up and go away. So you can win by delay. But they couldn't win this case against Santa Monica by delay. Time was going by as our lawsuit dragged on. And during that time, many other cities in California and the US discovered that their water supply was contaminated with MTBE. Two of our lawyers were also representing the city of South Lake Tahoe, which is a small city in Northern California. I think that case involved only two oil companies and they were not paying much attention to that case because it was a smaller case than Santa Monica's. There was less contamination. The South Lake Tahoe case being handled by two of our lawyers got to trial. Ah, and at the trial, South Lake Tahoe proved that the oil companies knew that MTBE would leak into water wells. They knew that would happen, but they hadn't told anyone that it would happen. So in the Lake Tahoe case, it was established that the oil companies had knowingly sold a dangerous product. That was a huge success for Lake Tahoe, but it was an even huger success for Santa Monica because we could use all the evidence from the South Lake Tahoe case in our case. So the decision in the South Lake Tahoe case made our case for us. After the verdict in the South Lake Tahoe case, after the jury decided that the oil companies knew MTBE was dangerous, but, but concealed that, after that, the oil companies agreed to settle with Santa Monica. The first settlement, which was uh, agreed to in the year 2002, required the oil companies to pay Santa Monica $90 million and also help the city build a water treatment facility to clean the wells. I actually didn't like that settlement because I didn't think we wanted to design a water treatment plant with oil companies. But the city was tired of the litigation. 90 million was a lot of money. And uh, some people in the city believed that we could actually design and build a treatment facility with the oil companies as a joint project that they would pay for. All right, the effort to do that with the oil companies lasted four years. And then at the end of four years, everyone gave up and said, this is not going to happen. We need to make a new settlement. The new settlement was all for cash. The oil companies said, we will pay you an amount of cash to be done with you. We wanna be done with you. By that time, MTBE was an issue in many, many places in the US and in the world. And so the oil companies were no longer uh, concealing this problem. And they just wanted to be rid of Santa Monica. So we made a new settlement for all cash. The oil companies eventually paid the city $252 million in cash. And we used much of that money to build a the water treatment facility that we wanted to have. It is what we call a state of the art, a, an excellent water treatment facility. It was completed in 2000, 
and 10. So 14 years after Joe and Craig burst into my office and said, we have an emergency, we had solved the problem. That demonstrates many things about environmental law in the US and about using the courts in the US to protect the environment and secure environmental uh, justice. Uh, we know from the story that the environment and use of the environment are heavily regulated in the United States. The agencies that regulate it are very powerful. Uh, however, the story also demonstrates the main complaint about the environmental laws in the US. They don't prevent environmental destruction. They regulate it and they slow it. The laws in the US tend to set contamination levels. So what those laws mean is, okay, you can destroy the environment this much, but that's all. Our environmental laws in the US work by striking a balance between protection of the environment and immediate economic prosperity. That is a juggling act, balancing act that we have undertaken uh, in the United States for 50 years now. It is a little like the juggling act that is going on in the United States and elsewhere now between health and economic prosperity. Uh, as this story demonstrates, with the environmental crisis growing and growing, our current system of protecting the environment, which sort of meters, we say, pollution, it regulates pollution and limits it, but it doesn't stop it. Our system of environmental protection is not adequate, and it's growing less and less adequate. So in the United States, many Many people are involved in an effort to change our legal paradigm. And this shift, the shift in the legal paradigm, is what Professor Mariana's article uh, is about. I, you have made it available to your students, I think, Mariana, is that right? I hope, I hope some of you have read it. I hope that you will all read it. It's, it's just an excellent, excellent article about um, harmony with nature and how that paradigm works in Brazil. And I particularly like the article because it was so honest. Um, much that is written about rights of nature and harmony with nature in the US is, it's not that it's dishonest, but it is um, incomplete. I thought um, Mariana's article written with Professor Alex Alessandro Pelizon was excellent because it, talked about steps being made in Brazil, steps being made in Brazil. We haven't achieved a solution, but we have taken first steps. And that is the same in the United States. Our legal systems are different, our societies are different, but we are in the same place. We have taken some beginning steps in the US to shift our legal paradigm to a paradigm that promotes respect for nature, recognizes that we are part of nature and not nature's owners. So the other two cases that I wanna to talk to you about are about rights of nature cases uh, in the US. The first has to do with uh, a small town in Pennsylvania, Grant Township. Pennsylvania is coal, historically is coal mining country in the United States. So, Extraction has always been the source, the economic uh, driver in Pennsylvania. Today, it is not so much coal mining as hydraulic fracturing, frac fracking for natural gas. Grant Township is a little town, 500 people, very, very teeny, very small compared to Santa Monica, which is 90,000 
teeny compared to Sao Paulo. Um, it's in the woods in Pennsylvania and the people there love their environment and they are close to their environment because there is no public water supply in Grant Township. People depend on private water wells. An energy company obtained a permit from the federal government to operate an injection well in Grant Township. An injection well is used to dispose of the waste material from fracking. The residents of Grant Township feared that the injection well would leak into their water wells and poison their wells. If their wells were poisoned, their property would become valueless because there would be no water supply. And they feared that they would have to leave Grant Township and that the town would die. So the people of Grant Township needed to try to stop this injection well, which had already been authorized by the federal government. One of the residents of Grant Township learned about the work being done by the Community Legal Environmental Defense Fund. That is a nonprofit organization, which we call CELDEF here in the United States. CELDEF had worked with many communities in Pennsylvania to uh, create and uh, enact laws that empowered local communities. The CELDF laws, which they called community rights laws, say that the local government controls the environment. The federal and state government can't control the environment. And any federal or state action to the contrary is not legal within that town. Well, as you probably know, we have a federal legal system here in the United States. Our, our government is based on the concept of federalism. Federal law is superior to state law here. State law is superior to local law. So as a matter of law in the United States, it is not possible for a local community to say federal law does not apply in this town. Indeed, if that were possible in the United States, there might still be small communities in the South that would still have lynchings. They would certainly still have segregation. But that doesn't happen because we have federal law that is at least intended to protect all citizens here. Nonetheless, CELDEF was helping communities in Pennsylvania with these community rights laws that were very popular because so many communities felt that their local environment was being destroyed by corporate activities, which were authorized by federal and state law. And so these communities began adopting community rights laws. And so the people of Grant Township turned to CELDEF for help. CELDEF operated by um, first organizing communities, training communities about how to get laws enacted, helping them write the laws and helping them get the laws passed. CELDEF also agreed in Grant Township to defend the community rights law if it was challenged legally. The Grant Township community rights law prohibited uh, injection wells within Grant Township. There are 
a couple of very good articles available that describe what happened at the town council meeting where this law was considered by the town council. The picture in those articles is three lawyers from the Energy Corporation. They were probably very like the oil company's lawyers. The articles say they were wearing expensive suits, formally dressed with their briefcases, leather briefcases. The people of Grant Township hardly ever even went to town council meetings, but they went to this one. And so their community hall was packed with people, very informal. The, th the three lawyers who were there told the town council, if you adopt this law, we will sue you and we will win. And when we win, you will be required to pay the energy company's legal fees, which will be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Of course, Grant Township did not have hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the attorneys warned or threatened the town of what would happen if this law was adopted. Well, the town adopted the law anyway. And uh, there has been much press coverage here of Grant Township. In the press coverage, town residents explain why the law was adopted anyway. It was simple. Grant Township had nothing to lose. CELDEF had promised the town that it would cover the town's expenses if the law was challenged. CELDEF promised the town that CELDEF lawyers would defend the law in court. So why wouldn't the town adopt the law? They had nothing to lose by adopting the law. They had everything to lose by the injection well going forward. The law was passed. The energy company filed a lawsuit in federal court. One of the things that the cell deaf community rights laws do is they take away the constitutional rights of corporations. Many people in the US believe that corporations should not have constitutional rights. They should not be treated legally as persons, but they do and they have for almost 100 years here. And among those rights is the right to use the courts. So this corporation, the energy company had the right under the federal constitution to sue the township about its law. The law which said, you can't sue the township about this law. The federal judge hearing the case decided that the law was unconstitutional and she invalidated it. This is the result that uh, lawyers all expected. Almost all lawyers expected that result. I think perhaps the CELDEF lawyers even expected that result because CELDEF's mission is political. Their mission is to promote the idea of community rights. And they also promote the idea of nature's rights. The Grant Township law, like other CELDEF laws, had a provision saying that nature and natural communities and environments have the right to exist and to flourish. That, those words were in the law, but that was not the focus of the law. The focus of the law was community rights versus the rights of corporations and the rights of the federal and state government. The judge in the Grant Township case invalidated the entire law. Uh, the controversy in Grant Township did not end because there was additional litigation between the state and Grant Township. The state in its lawsuit said that the city was, our word is preempted by state law, which means under state law, the city could not regulate disposal wells because they were regulated by state law, higher law, so the city didn't have any authority. That litigation between the state of Pennsylvania and Grant Township is still going on. It's been going on for years. There may be a trial later this year, but the federal lawsuit between the corporation and the town is over and the town lost and that law was invalidated. 
Altogether, community rights laws written by Selda have been adopted in 20 uh, cities, most of them very small and most of them in Pennsylvania in the US. All of those laws talk about the rights of nature. They all have rights of nature language. But the point of all those laws is promoting local control of the environment, not federal or state control. That's why they are called community rights laws. Of the 200 laws like that, that have been adopted in the US, 11 or 12 of them have been tested in court there have been 11 or 12 lawsuits claiming that those laws were invalid. All of the laws that were tested in court were invalidated. None of them withstood a legal challenge. But again, as I said, Seldev's main goals were not legal. They were political. Now I want to tell you about just one other case about a community rights law. This case is different from Grant Townships. This case involves Toledo's Lake Erie Bill of Rights. I don't know if you've heard of this. This, this law, Lake Erie's Bill of Rights, uh, we call LIBOR, Lake Erie's Bill of Rights. This case is very famous in the US and it was just decided earlier this year. This is also about a law uh, written and passed with help from Seldef. It is a little different, however, than Grant Township's law. After a number of Seldef's laws were invalidated in court, they changed the way they wrote their laws. The Grant Township law had prohibited injection wells in Grant Township. So there was a specific prohibition. Other cell death laws prohibited all fracking activities, for example. However, those laws were all struck down in court. So cell death changed the way it was writing its laws. The Toledo law does not prohibit anything. What it says is that Lake Erie and the residents of Toledo have the right to clean water. So it says, in essence, that Lake Erie has the right to be clean and that any government or corporation that violates that right is uh, guilty of a violation and the violation is a minor crime, what we would call a misdemeanor. So the Lake Erie Bill of Rights contempt, I'm sorry, the Lake Erie Bill of Rights prohibits doing things that would make Lake Erie's water unclean, but does not specify what those things are. Let me tell you a little about Lake Erie so, and Toledo. So this is in the industrial uh, northern northeastern, sort of the mid-northeast part of our country. It's uh, on the, Lake Erie is one of the five Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are the largest group of lakes in the world. The area has been heavily industrialized for 100 years. So uh, environmental pollution has been a big issue there for some time. The best known example of that is the river that flows into Lake Erie, the Cuyahoga River, catching fire. The Cuyahoga River is so polluted that it has actually caught fire. If you Google Cuyahoga River fire, you will see amazing pictures of a lake in flame. Oh, I'm sorry, a river in flames. And the Cuyahoga River did not burst into flames one time. It burst into flames 12 times before the federal and state governments finally, finally mandated a cleanup. So the area is, environmental pollution has been a huge issue in the area for decades. 
Libor was passed by Toledo because of a different pollution problem. That pollution problem is uh, an algae bloom in the lake. Toxic algae, a water plant, blooms in the lake from time to time. And it makes the drinking water from the lake poisonous. So about five years ago, there was a huge algae bloom in Lake Erie. And the city of Toledo, which is about 400,000 people, uh, shut down the drinking water supply for three days. So for three days, there was no water coming out of taps in homes in Toledo, no water available in restaurants or businesses. People had to buy water, water, water for three days. The people of Toledo were outraged at this. They thought that their governments had failed them by failing to protect the drinking water. And they were looking for a solution. So they turned to CELDEF, which wrote them a community rights law. As I said, that law did not prohibit anything, but it did generally prohibit contaminating the lake. So why was the algae bloom? Algae blooms in Lake Erie occur because of runoff from farms. Um, there are many river tributaries flowing into the lake. There are huge farms all along those rivers and they use phosphates. The phosphates run off from the farms into the lake and when the weather gets warm enough, the algae blooms. So you can see what this legal fight is going to be. This is going to be clean water versus enough food, right? Libor was adopted by the voters, not by the Toledo City Council. The Toledo City Council did not want to adopt the law because it knew that the law would be challenged in court and that it would be invalidated. Toledo, like all uh, cities of a certain size, has lawyers, in-house lawyers, who work for the city, as I did for Santa Monica. Part of the job of those lawyers is to explain to the city council what it can do legally and what it can't do. And so Toledo's lawyers were telling the city council, this law is going to be challenged in court, and it's going to fail in legally. So the Toledo uh, City Council did not adopt that law. However, however, it could be adopted a different way. Most states in the US give the people the power of initiative. I don't know, I don't think you have that in Brazil. Is that right? Okay. The way the power of initiative works is if enough people in a state want a law passed, but the legislature refuses to pass it. The people can gather signatures in support of the law. If they gather enough signatures, then the measure will go on the ballot and the people can adopt it by vote, by popular vote. And that's how Libor was eventually adopted in Toledo. So once again, as in Grant, Pennsylvania, Grant Township, Pennsylvania, it was known that this law might not survive legally, but it didn't matter to the people of Toledo who voted for it. They were just so angry about their water that they wanted this law to pass as a political statement, if nothing else. So it was passed. The day after the voters adopted Libor, a lawsuit was filed in federal court and it was filed by a corporate farming company. And their argument was, we are following the law. We are following all the laws that right, regulate farming in, the, in this state and in the US. We are allowed to use these phosphates. They made constitutional arguments as well as that practical argument. And one of their constitutional arguments was that the rights of nature provision in Libor 
was unconstitutionally vague. Our constitution has been interpreted by our courts to prohibit laws that are vague. There are three reasons for that prohibition. One reason is if a law is vague, then people don't know what they can do or not do. They might violate the law unintentionally. The second reason that, un that vague laws are unconstitutional is that vague laws give the police too much discretion. Just as the people don't know what a violation is, the police don't know what a violation is. And because they have so much discretion, there is a risk that their personal biases will influence their enforcement, as they probably do anyway. A huge problem in the US, as our current social unrest indicates. Anyway, that's the second reason vague laws are unconstitutional. The third reason, and actually the most interesting, I think, is and hard to understand, is that the courts have decided that vague laws do not reflect an adequate balance of competing social considerations. Making laws is almost always about balancing competing interests, right? So in saying that no one can harm Lake Erie, then any activity that harms Lake Erie would be illegal. The law is very vague, right? What can the farmers do? I mean, probably everyone who reads about the food supply in the world knows, which by the way, isn't adequate in many places. But we have all read that the only reason there is enough food in much of the world is because of the way we farm now. So the phosphates that the farms upriver from Toledo were using were legal. They were following all of the laws and they were following the laws not only about the use of phosphates, but also the laws about controlling and limiting discharge into the river. So the court invalidated Libor as unconstitutionally vague because it didn't, that law did not reflect the balancing of these competing policies that is the job of legislators. Libor was invalidated in February of this year. It was uh, perceived as a huge blow, a huge blow to the rights of nature movement in the United States. Actually, I'm not sure that it is, but many people think that it is. What it is, is a blow to the CELDEF model if that model was ever really intended to succeed in court, rather than just being intended as to advance a political movement, right? So in the US right now, I think that the uh, rights of nature movement uh, is looking for its direction forward now. There are many directions forward, and I, I think the movement in the US will continue and will continue to grow. It's just that people have to understand better how that movement can use uh, the legal system. I don't know what is the case in Brazil. As I said, I admired Professor Mariana's article because I thought it was uh, very realistic and very honest. Um, in the US, we would say it was right on, I thought. Uh, it is not, you cannot do magic by passing a law that says nature can uh, evolve and thrive, right? Though we all want that to happen, but just passing a law that says that isn't gonna make it happen in our legal system, but that's okay, that's okay. I wanna tell you why I think that's okay and why the decision in Libor shouldn't be discouraging. So many good things are happening in the US. Uh, the Native, Native American tribes have taken new leadership in the harmony with nature and rights of nature movement in the US. 
this is a very good thing for obvious reasons. Of course, I don't have to tell anyone from South America why it is a good reason, right? The Native Americans have always understood human connection to nature much better than our uh, the European conquerors understood it. Uh, also, there's another reason besides just spiritual attachment to nature that uh, it is good that the N Native Americans are increasingly become le becoming leaders in this country. And that is, they are operating in a different legal system. Federally recognized tribes have treaties with the federal government, which give them special rights that the rest of our society does not have. Additionally, federally recognized tribes have tribal courts, which have different authority than state and federal courts have. So it is quite possible that rights of nature laws will uh, do better in those tribal courts than in our state and federal courts. We will see. At any rate, that, that movement is very strong. There are other uh, reasons to be hopeful uh, in the US. The concept of nature's rights and of nature's right to exist, evolve, flourish, can be incorporated into our law as an aspirational and ethical foundation for other laws. Our best laws in the US and the ones that we are the most famous for and have the most difficulty implementing successfully are our, is our Bill of Rights. Okay? Our principle of freedom of speech, our principles of equal protection, and due process, those laws, they are laws, but they're aspirational, right? They aren't enforceable in court until they are implemented by other more specific laws, such as the Civil Rights Law of 1968, which means that a person who is treated unequally because of his or her race can go into federal court now since the 1960s and enforce the concept of equal protection. Likewise, cities can adopt laws that recognize the rights of nature and then implement that concept with more specific laws. Specific law might be a law prohibiting using plastic straws, right? requiring that all new structures in the city have electricity as opposed to natural gas, uh, requiring that rooftops on buildings be light instead of dark colored to reflect light. Here in the place where my husband and I live, which is Ventura County, California, the county adopted a law that protects uh, wildlife corridors. You can't build a new building, even on private property, in a wildlife corridor in Ventura County unless you meet certain standards that will enable wildlife to continue to move across your property. I think it's the first law of its kind in the country. It's a zoning law that protects wildlife. Uh, so local, state, and even the federal government can embrace the new paradigm of respect for nature and of recognizing that nature is more than human property and then implement implement that ethical, philosophical, and even spiritual concepts through more specific laws. And that is what Santa Monica has done. Its rights of nature law is, is an uh, aspirational foundation for its sustainability plan and for its many local uh, environmental laws. I want to conclude now, but I want to conclude by following Professor Mariana's instruction. I asked her for advice and she told me two things. She told me, speak from your own experience, which I have done in telling you about the case against the oil companies. And she also encouraged me to share how I feel. And so I want to conclude by telling you how I feel. I feel that it is essential that the developed world 
embrace this new paradigm of living in harmony with nature and respecting nature. I feel that if we don't, there is no future for us humans. And there is perhaps no future for life on earth as we know it. That is almost incomprehensible to me to think about that. To think about how many species are being killed is are disappearing. To think about uh, the ice melting in the far north and what that means to that environment. To think about the plastic pollution in the sea. All of these things are painful to me. That doesn't say so much about me, but it says a lot about my parents. Our, my parents raised my two brothers and me to believe that nature was our family. They didn't think about that. That's just who they were. They just believed that. And I grew up believing that. So for me, the movement to make this paradigm shift is just clearly as it should be. And so I am very happy in my retirement to have the opportunity to use the legal skills and knowledge that I inevitably acquired over, over you know, 45 years of doing it uh, to try to help with that global effort. And because it is my spiritual belief, it is something I'm very happy to have the chance to talk to you about today. So thank you. Thank you, my friend, for sharing your experience, all your experience with us today. Uh, it was a lecture, I think the best kind of lecture. Oh, thank so you. I, I don't have words to say thank you. And thank you, first of all, for your fighting for nature. And thank you for being the beauty person that you are. Oh, thank you. She's my mother, it's easy to fight for her. <laughs> yes, yes, all of us. And now I would like to hear Professor Deborah. Professor Deborah, uh, do you have any comments, uh, something to, to complement the, the Marcia speech? Uh, first of all, I would like to say that it was very moving and very inspiring, Dr. Marcia. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And it's my job here to promote a dialogue. So, <laughs> and well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my honor and my privilege to be here today and to address all of you. And I am very happy to be here. And I would like to thank uh, the University of Marina in the name of uh, Fernanda Serva for hosting us here. And it's a big opportunity to be among so distinguished professors, Professor Mariana, my dearest friend, Professor Tagore, and Professor Vladimir. So thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Marsha. It was just an amazing presentation. It was very inspiring, very moving, and it touched me a lot. And I prepared some words and that I, I would like to talk about. And I think it's similar to the way you think. I think so, <laughs> I bet so. And those ideas, your ideas, uh, brought memories of my childhood in the state of Paraná in the south part of Brazil. Uh, as I recall, I was about 10 or 11 years old when my father proposed a visit to Guaira Seven Falls. Uh, the Sete Quedas do Guaira. The trip was planned to see the magnificent waterfalls before the construction of Itaipu. Itaipu is a big hydroelectric power plant oh. that was going to be built. And Mariana is sharing the <laughs> Mariana is sharing the picture of Guaira Seven Falls. Uh, oh. This place doesn't exist anymore. And I'll tell wow. you why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I remember that my, my father, he worked for the uh, light company at that time. And so uh, the slogan, it was the 70s. And the slogan says, visit before it's over. 
And so uh, we went there, I remember uh, as today, that to get to our destiny, the roads were not paved, it was difficult to travel, and we could see engines along the way. It was magic for a girl uh, of 11, uh, in 11 uh, years old. Uh, but I could never forget, never, the series of immense waterfalls and the fantastic sound and power of the running water. Locals said that the sound of the Paraná River could be heard in 20 kilometers. Can you believe that? Wow. I was enchanted and captivated by its natural beauty. But I also remember coming back during the construction of Itaipu, the dreadful sound of the dynamite explosions, explosions that diverted, that changed the course of the Paraná River. It took only 15 days and the Seven Falls, the Guaira Seven Falls, were completely submerged under the artificial lake created by the Itaipu Dam. And I remember how sad I was and ashamed. But my yeah. father, on the other hand, he was proud of the engineering yeah. work of art and explained to me, his 11-year-old child, the benefits of Itaipu, despite the expropriation of productive land and its, its social impact, the environmental damages, such the loss of animals and plants, and the migration of the fishes and the dismiss of birds. And I also, uh, he also explained to me at that time, the meaning of Itaipu. Itaipu is uh, in the Guarani language, Ita means pedra eh, or <laughs> stone. I means water, agua. And Po means uh, the movement of the water, the sound of the water. So Itaipu means the sounding stone. What a paradox. If you plan to, to go there uh, and you will see the huge lake, lake covers the seven falls and no sound of the running water is heard. Only the silence of the amputated river. So I ha we have another picture, Mariana. It's, I think we can leave it there. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's yes. wonderful, yes. And those memories are imprinted in my soul and somehow invited me to live in harmony with nature, yes. to be engaged in its protection and to acknowledge its value. Brazil has a modern constitution. It's called the Green Constitution. We have special environmental, environmental legislation. Uh, now it's encouraged mediation uh, this, uh, instead of litigation. Despite that, our legal system leads to endless and costly trial suits. Working 30 years of, as a public attorney for the city of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is the biggest city of Latin America. I have faced a lot of problems concerning damages to nature, hard or impossible to repair caused by the disrespect of our environmental rules, greedy of big corporations, and irresponsible public policies. It's urgent to establish a model of development capable of respecting, respecting the ecosystem. Uh, there is a global movement to grant legal rights or personhood to nature, but is it enough? Right. I know it's a complex issue to cope with. I, I realize that. Uh, but I strongly believe, following the decisions of Corte Suprema de Justicia de Colombia, the Supreme Court of Colombia, that environmental rights of future generations are based on two pillars. One, ethical duty of solidarity of the species, humans and non-humans, Equal consideration applies to all beings that, are, that have interests. And the second pillar, the instinctive value of nature, 
transcending the anthropocentric perspective. As Mariana, <laughs> in her article, thought about so. Uh, we must raise mankind's awareness of collective construction of a life in harmony with nature as equals. If, if we want to act in solidarity, we should recognize that all those issues are our own issues. Right. And referring to Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. We can create change, we can make a difference, and we are doing it now and here with a single tool, education. Uh, in her fight for solidarity, Pia Clem says, and I quote, I am part of a generation that grew up asking their grandparents, what did you do against it? But I become to realize that I'm also part of the generation that will have to answer the same question to their children and grandchildren, end of quote. So Dr. Marsha, my question is, how can we engage people to recognize nature's inherent value? What can we do to protect and preserve values that we took for granted for our and future generations? Thank you so much. I think, I think that sadly, perhaps, we have come to a time when all we need to say to people is look around, look at what's happening to you now. My husband and I live uh, at the backside of the Santa Monica Mountains. We live in a beautiful place that is very fire prone. There was a wildfire all around us two years ago. That fire changed the way, which was huge, changed the way many people I know think. The pandemic, which is terrible, but it's changing the way people think. I think we have finally come perhaps to the place where uh, in English, we would say our back is to the wall. We're in a corner now. It's become impossible almost to ignore what is happening to the environment. So I ask myself, who, who has helped people ignore this for so long? It, I only know in my country, right? I have, unfortunately, I have only lived in the US and only in California in my life. But I know what the problem is in the US. In the US, people blind themselves to nature and they overconsume. They overconsume unbelievably. And that is very bad for us and for the whole rest of the world. And it's very unfair and it's just wrong. But why do they do that? Why do they do that? Because there are many reasons, but one is they are very influenced by two things, corporate advertising and the easy availability of products that are very bad for the environment. I don't know how it is there. I have never shopped in Sao Paulo because I've never been there. But here, you can buy everything in plastic containers. Mm -hmm. right? Plastic containers. If you go to a Starbucks here because you need to eat, your meal will be in a little hard plastic container. I don't know what uh, we would say the half-life of that plastic is, but it's probably thousands of years, right? It's probably not even really recyclable, even though it says it is, right? So in the US, people are living uh, conveniently, right? 
And as to food and plastic containers, they are even living cheaply, which they may have to do, but they are not living well. They are not living well. I think that what Mother Earth really needs is not so much a good lawyer or a smart professor. I think Mother Nature needs a good publicist, right? <laughs> yes. I have told people, Mother Nature should have the publicist that is used by the Cardassian sisters, <laughs> right? I mean, can you imagine that they are so successful? There's nothing there to be successful, nothing that matters. All right. So I think the message has to be look around. And I think the message has to be directed to consumers because I will tell you this, corporations will change when people stop consuming their product, right? The oil companies, the very oil companies that I spent so much of my career litigating against, they are moving to plastic, right? They're moving away from fossil fuels to plastic. Right. So I think what needs to happen, at least in the US, is a continuation of the present consumer uprising. Consumers here who have uh, enough money to consume are demanding more of corporations. And that works. Did you read about the conference at Davos this year? Mm -hmm. Corporate leaders were in English, we would say falling all over each other to express their commitment to the environment. Now, do we really believe them? Probably not, but no matter, we must hold them to that. And at the same time, I think here in the US, I believe, well, the federal administration needs to change and I think it will, but we need, we need to give much more help to Americans with low incomes to help them lead a better life. Right now, they are eating very bad food that comes in plastic containers. They're doing that because the very bad food in the plastic container is very cheap and they don't have enough money. And that's the truth. So I, I think that those of us with enough money to make choices have to think very carefully about what we consume and how much we consume, because I think corporations will change what they sell if we demand it. They will follow our lead. They're not leading, they're following the market. They're also growing it as they follow it. And I think in this country, we need a new administration and a government that makes it more possible for Americans with less income to, as you would say, live well. Uh, in the country and well means in better harmony with nature. So I think it's an educational process partly. I think it's a publicity uh, process. I think it's a process for consumers. And one more thing, I think the education of the young people that is happening now is just wonderful. It's wonderful. I have such hope. I have such hope for the time people who are now in their 20s. I have such hope for 20 years from now when they are in their 40s and 50s and they are leading because their thinking is good, but that's a long time away. And er, we are harming Earth, Mother Earth very fast. So we can't really wait on them. We have to continue to encourage them, but we have to take action now as we continue to educate them. So that's what I think. Thank, Thank you, Marcia. Marcia. Thank you, Professor Deborah. Now I would like to hear the opinion of my friend from Bahia. Please, Professor Tagori. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for Professor Mariana for being here each organize this amazing event. Uh, I would like to say thank you, Professor Vladimir. Actually, I was in the compad uh, some days ago, and I saw the review, the, the, my first article that I wrote in Brazil. I published it in the, in the Vladimir's review. And I saw one of them in, in compared when I was talking about 
uh, in the editor's commentary, and I saw that, oh, I remember you. It's a, a pleasure to be here with you. And Professor Deborah, thanks so much. Uh, uh, nice to meet you, and, uh, and thank you for your uh, comments and debate. And Professor Marcia, thank you. You are a, actually, uh, you live in a great place to talk about nature, uh, right <laughs> of nature. Actually, it's Santa Monica in California. Every, uh, uh, I, when, when Marianne invited me to talk to you, I remember Christoph Stone and I remember Sierra Club versus Morton. Yeah. And I said, you are come, I need, I have to talk to Professor Marsh about it and say that like uh, I, uh, I have written about animal rights in Brazil and environmental law. Uh -huh. And when I talk about rights of nature, uh, I remember, uh, I remember that debate in the Cruise of Stone and not just this, I remember what happened in that time. Uh, uh, and I organized some questions, some uh, comments to talk to you. So the first of all, it's like uh, 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 the first debate I want to I want to talk here. It's like uh, how can I can organize this big picture that you talk about your article? Your article you wrote that there is a, a, a people, students, everyone need to see the pic the picture. Uh, inside the new view uh, uh, of nature. Uh, that means like uh, you say that you need to understand that you are part of nature. You're not a property, you're not an owner of that right. nature. Right. But how can I think like that? If I live in a country that think, you said this in your article, you know, I, I live in a country that think the business uh, for Brazilians, for Americans, it's business. So like uh, you have to use, you have to use the environment around you. You have to use everything that like uh, you can produce, uh, uh, produce and make our economy better for the humans. How can I, uh, how can I organize my, in, in my student's mind that big, that big picture that you said in your article? This is the first question that I want to talk to you. And the second one, I remember I live in a state in Brazil called Bahia. It's not, it is in northeastern Brazil. And Bahia is a place, uh, everyone loves Bahia because it's a place that you can find uh, no, but no just culture, a uh, hill culture, but you can find a huge part of environment. Huh. So it's like, a, how, can I, I, how can I say for my, uh, 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 my students, uh, in my people that you need to protect this environment, this environment, because like, uh, uh, if you don't do that, uh, you'll be worth for them. How can I, how can I use the education, as you said in your article, uh, uh, to inspire this, that people that have so many problems now in the right. pandemic time to understand, such as uh, like a uh, poverty, uh, right. health, uh, uh, right. health problems, right. uh, uh, education problems, and, and some concerns that came with uh, uh, a slave culture that came in the colonization of Brazil. How can I can explain for them this, uh, uh, this meaning that oh, you need to protect everything that uh, are around you because you are part of this? Right. Uh, this is the second one, right. and uh, and when you talk about Santa Monica, uh, I remember so much such like uh, uh, some debates about Earth jurisprudence, yes. uh, uh, so the Thomas Berry words, the Aud Leopold, yes. uh, the the uh, Chris of Stone also uh, some of the debates. And I remember that some Latin American countries uh, organize uh, uh, or pass, pass some laws that debate about nature of rights. And now, nowadays you can see around the world several uh, decisions that organize a jurisprudence that try to show that nature uh, has some rights. 
you can find this kind of jurisprudence in Bangladesh, Colombia, Ecuador, India. Uh, actually, you can find this in the uh, concept of Pachamama and the Ecuador, Ecuador uh, mm -hmm. uh, country. But in California, but in California, perhaps the more civil law state in the US, uh, you, can, you, you, can find some, you can find some laws that protect uh, the environment. But uh, in the same time, you see that EPA uh, in the Trump's government uh, try to uh, pass everything that make the economy bigger. Yes. So it's like, how can I, how can I organize? How can I organize? Like, I, I found uh, since 1972, you can find uh, with the Douglas, Justice Douglas decisions mm -hmm. and in the, in the California court, you can find a, a, a same sentence that like a talk about rights of nature. But nowadays you find a government that like, a, 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 actually a, just Douglas said this in that decision in 1972. Yes. He said that like the government, the most, the strongest problem in the US probably will be the pol political obstacle. obstacle. Yes. And nowadays you find the same obstacle Yes. How can I organize this idea and, and show it's like a show for everyone and encounter such Brazil that like you can you can look forward and say that like you protect humans because right of nature is right of the humans. You can protect animals and you can protect the place that everyone lives. Professor Masha, I think it's, this is my comments. Like uh, I, I try to organize with you these big pictures that you said in your article. It's like uh, understand uh, understand this uh, this new scenario, and say that like uh, in this new concept of live well that you said, yeah. it's like uh, you need to introduce new beings. You need to introduce uh, non-humans. You need to introduce birds. Aqui estão os principais you, resultados you need, da pesquisa. You need to introduce uh, 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 new living beings yes. uh, that sometimes the, the jurisprudence and the law and our, prof the law, our law professors uh, didn't figure out how, uh, how can you uh, do that in the past. But you look forward and say that, like, if I don't change my mind, I don't change the, the path that I made before, probably in the future, you, you, you don't have any uh, control, any environment for anyone. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. And thank you, Professor Mariana. I can, I can share my thoughts with you. Um, and I have many, I don't know which are useful to you. I think how to uh, teach this change, how to make this change happen. I think it's different in different countries probably because I are, are as I said, I am ignorant because I've never lived anywhere else in the world, right? I do myself live in a very divided country. So, and so I know from that, that uh, social groups, including states and countries are very different. In the US, I don't know if you all have spent time here. I certainly know that Marianne has been here, but I don't know how much time you spent, but the Western part of our country, the West is very different than the Eastern part of our country, enormously different and in every way. And because the nature and the earth are different in the two parts of our country, and because the two parts of our country grew differently, the values are different as well in different places, and the organizations are different. So from that, from growing up here and observing that, I think it must be that countries are similarly very different. In the US, I do not believe 
that the legal system is going to lead the way on this change. I don't think it can. The legal system very seldom leads here. Once in a while it does. And when it does, that doesn't end up working very well. Let me give you an example. You mentioned Justice Douglas. When Justice Douglas wrote that famous dissent in Sierra Club versus Morton, where he incorporated the idea of who speaks for the trees. When he wrote that, I was just beginning law school. And oh my God, I fell in love with him. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, if I could have anything I wanted, I would have lunch with Justice Douglas. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> yes, yes, me. It would be a large lunch. Everyone would want to come. Um, so let me talk about him for a second. So probably you have read the stories about him. Justice Douglas, who was from the West, would go to the Pacific Northwest where we have beautiful redwood forests. If you have never seen a redwood forest, you must try to see one during your lifetime. The trees, the old trees are 2000 years old in the redwood forest. And it's like, I don't know what to say. It's like being inside a church. Justice Douglas would go hiking in the mountains. And he would do that even when there was an opinion he needed to be writing for the Supreme Court of the United States. And the story is that he would hike in the mountains all weekend, he would come down out of the mountains, he would drive to a phone booth because we had phone booths then, and he would pick up the phone and he would dictate the opinion into the phone. Can you imagine? I mean, I get ready to give a simple talk to you and I spend hours and hours trying to decide what I want to say. You know, it's not because I don't have ideas. It's because I don't want to waste your time. And so I have to think about what I might say and then pick out what might be useful. And it's very hard for me. He dictated Supreme Court opinions on the phone. He might have dictated that most famous defense, this dissent on the phone, you know. But why could he do that? because he had just gone and done what inspired him, which was being outside, right? So what does that tell us? I think, I don't think this is really a legal matter. I do my work with the tools that I have, which are legal tools. I think this is a spiritual matter. I think it's about our basic values. I think, I think that people will make these changes, even in my country, which is the biggest impediment to these changes. My country is the biggest impediment, and I know that. I understand that, I hate this word, but I understand that in countries which are not developed, I hate that word, I hate it, because we use it to mean booming economy, big buildings, constant growth. To me, that is not developing, but there it is. Physically, it's development. I understand completely, and I think every thinking person in the US understands completely that you can't tell poor people in, excuse me, undeveloped nations, you can't cut down that forest because you want to feed your children because the whole earth needs the forest. That won't work. If it was my children, I would cut down the forest. I would do anything to keep my children alive. I would be very sad that I was in that position. I would hope that my children would inherit a much better world, but I would do it. So I think, I think what's going to make the change in the US is people's concern about the other people that they love. I think people will act to protect their children. I think they will act to protect their grandchildren. Right now, thinking people are wrestling with how they balance their love or their mother or their grandmother with their income, right? Because that's the choice people are making here in the US. Some people aren't even thinking they're just going to bars because they miss having the company. I get that, I used to be young. But, but I think that people will be motivated in this country by their love of family, even if they don't love nature. But I think also, I think also they are being motivated in this country by how this country is changing right now. Right now, this country is changing at a speed that I haven't seen since the 1960s. 
And actually the change now is more. And why do I say that? Why do I say that? This country has never understood the concept of colonialism. We've never understood it here. That's outrageous, but we haven't, we haven't. When I was growing up, going to elementary school in California, I learned that there were native Californians who somehow managed to eat acorns. And then the Spanish marched up from Mexico and made missions and took care of the Californians, the native Californians. That is not what happened. That is not what happened. When the Spanish marched up from Mexico, uh, colonizing California for Spain before they left Mexico, the native Californians died in huge numbers, right? They couldn't live the life in the missions and the missions really didn't want them to. The missions wanted slave labor. But in my country, people have not thought about that in my lifetime until now. And why are they thinking about it now? I would like to tell you it's because they're becoming enlightened. I don't believe that. I believe it's happening now because for the first time in my lifetime, the US does not have a white majority. The first time. California has not had a white majority for years, but for the first time in the US, that is, this, that is the reality. And so people are thinking about uh, oppression and exploitation because they're forced to, they have to. People are in the streets, they have to think about it. I believe that those demonstrations in the streets here, which are really about racism, they're focused on racism, but I believe that the underlying message of all of that is that all of us are one, all life is one. I think the days of the US running on, operating on the assumption that the way to have prosperity is to continue to have a growing, growing, growing economy to exploit nature more and more and more. I think that's coming to an end. My worry is that it won't come to an end fast enough, you know, because the peril is great right now. I'm not really answering your question. Your question was how to teach this to students who, who may be living in a place where it's very hard to understand that nature is limited, right? The only place in the US where I have spent much time, where the same difficulty exists is Alaska. I love Alaska. You pr probably you haven't been to Alaska. It's a long way from where you are. It is the only frontier left in the United States. It's absolutely amazing. I do so hope that you will see a redwood forest in Alaska sometime in your life. Alaska has more moose than it has people. It, it's just a whole different thing. It is largely uninhabited. When you are there, it looks endless. It looks like you could cut down any tree, take any resource, and it wouldn't matter because there's so much of it. But that's not the fact. The fact is the permafrost is melting in Alaska. When the permafrost melts in Alaska, as other places in the far north, in the Arctic, the, the, the whole ecology is in danger immediately, not later, immediately. So even, I don't know how it is in Brazil where you live, but, but even in the US, in the wildest part of the US, the global environmental catastrophe is evident. I think that has to be shown to people. And I think it has to be shown to them with pictures, like the wonderful picture of that incredibly beautiful waterfall that is now gone. What a heartbreak. I look at that picture and I practically burst into tears. And I don't, I've never even seen it. All I've seen is a picture of it. But we are very vis visual, us humans, you know. So that publicist that I said nature needs, that publicist needs a good photo gallery, for one thing. I think it's important when you can to show things to people along with educating them. And I think, again, the education that's happening finally in the US about colonialism, uh, so long overdue. I mean, I grew up being taught in school that Christopher Columbus discovered America. Imagine that, imagine that. I mean, there were civilizations here for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years. 
some very advanced civilizations. There was a there was a civilization just east of the Missouri River, the Mound people. And in the year 800, that city was bigger than London. And nobody's even heard of it, except people who grew up in Missouri, like my husband, and I've been there with him. So, so part of it, it isn't just the white European anthropocentric view that's of nature that's a problem. It's the white anthropocentric view of everything that's a problem, including our economy and how it should work and how we should live and the ridiculous assumption that we can all somehow live well if we just keep growing and growing and growing, which means exploiting, exploiting, exploiting. But I really think we're finally at a point where people can start to see that, but I think they have to see with their eyes, even if it's pictures. I think that's I've spent my whole life on words because the law is about words, you know, so I spent my whole career on it. Once in a while, there's some words that work. Who speaks for the trees, right? That worked. Black Lives Matter works in the US now. But usually it's not words. Usually it's seeing with your eyes or feeling with your heart that changes how people act. You're a good speaker. You probably can inspire your students. But I know it's asking <laughs> a lot because there's so much change that's needed. Thank you so much, Professor Marcia. Mariana, thank you so much. Thank you both, my dear friends. Uh, and now I would like to hear the opinion of Professor Vladimir. Professor, Professor Vladimir, it's an honor for us to have you here with us today. Começar em português, gostaria de cumprimentar é, a Unimar, em nome da, da sua pró-reitora, minha queridíssima amiga, professora Fernanda Serva. Né? Também gostaria de deixar registrado o meu apreço e admiração pelo professor, coordenador do programa de mestrado e doutorado, o professor Jonathan Vita. Né? Gostaria de agradecer muitíssimo o convite, dizer que é uma honra que me sinto lisonjeado com o convite da professora Mariana Santiago, né? dizer que é sempre um prazer participar de todas as atividades, eventos e pesquisas com a professora. Né? Gostaria também de cumprimentar a prezada professora Débora Lambach, minha colega de PUC São Paulo, né? e que falou aos nossos corações, né? contando e dando testemunho de vida, né? que muito acrescentou aqui aos debates, e é muito bom saber e ver grandes civilistas olhando um tema tão espinhoso e importante, é, em especial para o nosso país, mas para o mundo de uma maneira geral. Né? Também gostaria de cumprimentar meu querido amigo Tagore Trajano, né? é, professor renomado e que há anos se dedica a essa temática, né? e que já tivemos a oportunidade né, de trocar né, conhecimento, discussões sobre é, o tema aqui. Né? Eu lembro quando recebi o primeiro artigo, mas não ficou no primeiro. Né? É, tenho sido brindado com diversas contribuições importantes do professor Tagore. Né? Inclusive, né? É, em breve, teremos mais uma publicação do professor Tagore né? na nossa é, revista, na nossa comunidade, da nossa sociedade, que é o Comped. Né? Gostaria também de cumprimentar a Sinara Lacerda, presidente da FEPOD, né? querida amiga, né? e que acompanha a sua trajetória e parabenizá-la aí por todo o crescimento dos últimos é, dos, dos últimos anos que tenho acompanhado a sua grande trajetória. Né? Muito bem. É, agora vou passar para o inglês, né? então vamos lá. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to greet, recognize and congratulate the former Santa Monica City Attorney, Marsha Moultrie, for the brilliant and moving lecture and her great legal work also on such and complex and important topics. In this sense, I also congratulate Professor Mariana Santiago for the beautiful initiative to promote these virtual academic dialogues in times of overcoming due to the coronavirus pandemic. Professor Mariana has also stood out as one of the great, the great, excuse me, 
great civilist of her generation, but in recent years, she has also stood out for building bridges with foreign universities and groups of law professors from around the world. Parallel to this process, she has also deepened the team of this afternoon and today. She's already uh, one of the great reference in, in this subject in Brazil, and I can say in Latin America also. In this sense, Unimar's master and doctoral program in law is projected internationally and produce relevant scientific production. Therefore, I'm even more honored with the invitation, and I repeat, Professor Mariana, to always count on me and your projects. That said, I would like to ask many questions, but I will limit myself for a few points that I believe are fundamental to the propose of this debate because of the time. So let's start with the first question uh, to Mrs. Uh, to Marsha uh, Moutry. Uh, And let's start with uh, talking about the green bonds, because uh, uh, we kind of talk uh, about them. Capital market has numerous financial instruments that are used in projects in order to leverage companies, city, or even countries. On such instrument, it is it the so-called debt securities, and they are mostly used to financial to finance excuse me infrastructure infrastructure projects over the years capital market issue debt securities to project that met the demands of business sector primarily however from the equator principle on launch in 2002 through the joint action of the international finance corporation ifc a World Bank body and ABN Emerald Bank, a paradigm for issuing these bonds has been broken. This is because since then, criteria have been developed for responsible investments that is ensuring that funding projects are developed in a social and environmentally responsible manner. In this other words, in other words, social and environment awareness is sought so that investments in uh, infrastructure projects have the, le the least possible impacts on the environment. Mm -hmm. After all, environment disasters pose not only a, fi a financial risk for the companies, but also for the right. image towards investors and consumer. Right. It is in this context that so-called green bonds uh, were created, were created. What do you think about the green bonds and they being used in US contests? Second question, in general, uh, what kind of benefits you think society might have with such a kind of new financial instruments? I have... Uh, other questions, but I'll try to resume. The third uh, would be, what are the main challenges, challenges and obstacles to the effective, effective implement, implementation of the sustainable, I'm sorry, sustainable uh, development goals and implementation and or incorporation of accountability, governance and transparency in today's society. Right. right, right. So first, as as to the green bonds, I yes, they are not talked about as green bonds so much in the U.S. However, however, there is rapidly growing uh, interest in the U.S. in individuals uh, shifting their invest and their investment portfolios to uh, greener companies, 
right? That is that is rapidly becoming uh, a very significant movement uh, here in the U.S. So there is, I would say, very rapidly growing interest in this country in finding new vehicles, new financial vehicles for promoting the welfare uh, of the environment. That is, insofar as I am aware of it, that is principally a movement involving uh, individual investments, but also corporate investments. We have, we have uh, funds here that only invest, only make green investments, and they are becoming uh, rapidly much more popular because it is a bit like what I was saying earlier about consumerism being the away. shift of paradigm. Yes, shifting the paradigm to ensuring it is a way that all of us who are fortunate enough to have any investments can actually easily support the environment. We can ensure that our investments are either in are either green investments or at minimum that we are not invested in things that are harmful to the environment. But what I really like about your question and the attention you are drawing to green bonds is, is that it addresses a main concern of mine, which is that the environmental problems are the whole world's problems together. Some of us are being more destructive than others. The US is being very destructive and some undeveloped countries are being destructive, but they have a better re they have a reason to. We don't even have a reason. We don't have to do this this way. But there is a lack of, as you well know, there is a lack of worldwide institutions right? Especially now when the U.S. doesn't even want to be a part of whatever worldwide structure there is, that will change. I believe that will change in November. Dear God. But, but we do have, as you well know, we as we all know from our 2008 economic collapse, we have a worldwide financial system. And so it is so important that that worldwide network of finance be harnessed as a tool to confront the environmental catastrophe through the adaptation of existing uh, financial instruments and institutions, including things like green bonds. So one thing I think is that People here in the U.S. need to know more about those opportunities. I believe, except for what I mentioned, investments in environmentally oriented funds and so on, I believe that people in the U.S. know very little about that. I think you know much more than most people, even educated people in the U.S. know about that. But, but obviously, obviously that the use of the worldwide financial organizations and network and instruments is um, a huge component of, of how to save mother, obviously. <laughs> and obstacles, you asked about obstacles to um, uh, sustainability and nature's rights. Again, I will go back to what I said before. Partly, you see, I am, I am not, unlike all of you, I am not a scholar. I am a lawyer and I'm practical uh, and I know how the legal system works and I'm fortunate to be educated, but I don't, I am not academic and I actually don't even think very well at that, at that level. But I have thoughts about people and how they, how they behave. I think people are frightened of change. I think I'm sorry, I'm going to sound, be, make a racial statement again. I think, I think white America, which has dominated this country for so long, is very afraid right now. They're afraid of the change that's coming. They're, we, and they're, it's not they, it's me. Uh, they don't know what it means. They don't know what it means that America is not majority white anymore. 
And I think the fear of change is what has driven the populist, we call it populist, it's not really, but the populist movement around the world that has put in place leaders like our own president, right? In many countries in the world now, as you know, there are, <laughs> there are um, very conservative leaders who are dedicated to protecting and furthering the status quo. That status quo has worked for them, right? And so they are clinging on to it, but it is very bad for all of us. That is a huge impediment. I, but you see, I think that ideas, inertia movement, inertia yeah, movement. But I think that I, I think that ideas like green bonds actually may be comforting to the better educated of them, because they can relate to that. They can relate to that. Most American lawyers can't even relate to the concept of rights of nature, you know, because our legal system here protects property rights, individual rights, but all but property rights hugely. So they don't know what that means and it worries them. If you say to them, to those same lawyers, we must live in better harmony with nature, they are comfortable. The word rights is confusing because there's a question about what that means. It could mean substantive rights, it could mean procedural rights, it could be, you could be talking about enforcement in court or maybe not, they're confused. But I think the way to go is to find mechanisms that are comfortable for more people you know, and, and so they could see a path forward that is greener and more harmonious with nature, but not utterly foreign to them. So that's what I think. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you, sure. Professor Vladimir. Thank you. Uh, that was so interesting. <laughs> Marsha, uh, I'm, I'm so glad, I'm so happy to, to share in this amazing, this amazing time with you. Uh, it's a great opportunity for me and for my students. My students are making some questions for you. We don't have so much time to, to make all this, that question, but one point, I think it will be interesting to, to hear you about and it's about the theory of the growth uh, like uh, the proposal of professor Serge Latouche uh, the French professor and I think it's it's like a kind of uh, a break with the the idea of sustainable development for something a little more radical because uh, we see in Brazil that this kind of idea, we it, it doesn't protect us about the 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 crimes in, in environmental. So yeah. some students are, are are thinking about maybe it will be necessary another another kind of idea and another kind of theory a little more radical about the protagonism of nature. And I would like to hear you about, sometimes I have the, the, the thought that this, this kind of theory, development and sustainability, it can be used against us like a, a greenwashing. Some, uh, yes. Yes. And in fact, we can change the things as we like to do. So I, I would like to hear you about it. That's interesting. I. You are making me feel better, Mariana, because I often worry about the concept of sustainable development. I am, like all of you, very uh, familiar with the UN's um, sustainable development goals, you know, and I, I have not been, I've only been connected with the UN's work for a couple of years, so you all probably know more about it than I do, but it strikes me that because of what the UN is and how it is funded or underfunded, right? And that it depends mostly on voluntary cooperation, you know? I believe it is, um, how can I say this? It will inevitably look for 
common ground and an idea that will be acceptable to all, which is a different thing than making a choice. Right? So, of course, much of the world, in much of the world, people want and need more development. Of course, that's true. If you don't have enough food or water for your children, you want more, of course. On the other hand, in much of the world, what we need to do is limit development, turn away from it as a way of uh, succeeding as an economy, as a country, as people. So there's the UN trying to put these very different situations and viewpoints together, which must be very hard. I can't imagine having that job. I would fail. Um, I don't like phrases like sustainable development because I don't know what that is. And uh, of course, of course, it is an attempt to harmonize two concepts, ideas that may be opposite, that may be antithetic to one another, right? Yes, we can have development, but it has to be sustainable. Well, that's hard to argue with, but what does it mean? And is it an illusion? And by promoting that phrase, are you perpetuating an illusion, which is dangerous, right? When it really may be the case that certain choices must be made. I know in law, I, I spent many years doing litigation before I was the city attorney. And people always said that they were looking for a resolution that was a win-win. There were two sides, but there must be a way for both of them to win. Well, sometimes, sometimes there's a win-win. Usually what needs to happen is that both sides need to give something, right? To find where they could possibly agree on a meeting. One of our sons came home from college and he had just learned about what the destruction of the Amazon rainforest could mean to the rest of the world. He was, he was young, he was 17. And he came home and he said, this is terrible. What can be done? What can be done? How do you fix this? How do you find the win-win in this? You know, he didn't say it that way, but that's what he meant. And I don't know. I have a vague concept that societies with more than enough, like the one I live in, must be more willing to share with those that don't. When I was very young and growing up, I went to I went to uh, Berkeley. I went to college in Berkeley in the 1960s. So I was there when the free speech movement happened, something you've probably not even heard of, but was a big deal at the time. So I've spent a lot of my life uh, thinking of conflict and how it resolves. And uh, sometimes somebody wins and somebody loses. That happens a lot. That happens a lot. But the question for me is who can afford to give up what? You know? Uh, so yes, like you, Mariana, I'm, I'm worried about the idea of sustainable development. I, it might exist in small situations, right? But how is it really different than the criticism about traditional environmental laws? How is it really different than you're just metering out and slowing destruction. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I used to think at Berkeley that nationalism was going to go away. We were all going to live in peace with each other. I was very young. Um, I think now as an old lady, I think people are tribal by nature. And it takes an effort to reach beyond what we're comfortable with, what's familiar to us, beyond our tribe. I was lucky. I grew up in a family that thought it was very interesting that other people did things a different way. And wouldn't it be exciting to learn how they think and how they do things? But then we had enough. We, my parents weren't scared. They'd been through horrible things, the Second World War, where my dad was shot. But, but they believed 
that we could all learn from each other and that that would be exciting and wonderful. I think that's, I didn't know they were unusual at the time. I think now they probably were. But like you, I'm worried about sustainable development. And so I can't say anything comforting about it. Yes, it might be a goal we have to shoot for, but I think we cannot allow ourselves to be sort of entranced by these magical words that in themselves sound like a solution. They aren't a solution. It's like, it's not as admirable, but it's like saying love one another. Easy to say, right, hard to do, you know? So I don't have an answer for you and your students, but I think you're right to be asking that question of what is it, and it's right to keep challenging it because we all know there's no magic answer to the, to the, to the environmental catastrophe. There isn't one. We're gonna to have to struggle along and it's gonna be uphill, right? Okay, Marsha, thank you. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I think oh, we will have to say thank you forever. Uh, well, we have uh, to just keep wishing, working together, right? <laughs> I think you should be on my university in the future to, to a complimentary lecture. It will thank be you. very great to have you, you in, in person in my university. I would love that. I would love to see Brazil. I've never even been to South America. The furthest south I've been is the Panama Canal. I would love to see it. I read about Brazil to get thank ready you, for thank this. You. What a place. And I'm sure that your presence, your presence here today will enlighten my students to, to be in this fight, this fighting for nature. I think uh, the university, it's a good place for it. It's yes, the right it is. place for it. It is. And it's our duty, like professors, any kind of professors, to, to fight for nature as professors and, and as citizens. Too. Yes. So we're completely out of time. And thank I you. want to say thank you for the last time, I promise. But I would like to hear you and your final words to my students, please. My can you final say, word? can you, uh, yes, a short message to, to my, short it mes for my, my short message to you is that you have the good fortune to become adults in a very interesting and difficult time when there are causes and fights that are worth your time. You have nothing more valuable than your time. And this fight to protect our mother earth is worth your time. Thank you, Masha. Thank you Thank all. you for all the professors that- Thank you all, it's so nice to meet you. With us and my colleagues that are watching us by on YouTube. Uh, I will talk a little in Portuguese. Uh, eu tento mudar para português, para inglês, e, e já a professora já não sabe mais que idioma fala, porque cada dia aqui é uma surpresa diferente nesse projeto. Eu queria agradecer em português aos meus alunos. Não se faz internacionalização sem a presença de vocês. Nós fizemos um evento pesado, um evento em inglês, um evento que durou duas horas e vinte e vocês estiveram com a gente. Eu não tenho palavras para agradecer a confiança. Isso me dá forças para seguir com esse projeto, e eu garanto uma coisa para vocês, viu? Se tiver pandemia, e por um ano, nós vamos ficar um ano aqui trazendo um professor estrangeiro por semana para ampliar o nosso conhecimento enquanto essa situação difícil durar. Obrigada pelo apoio de vocês, obrigada pelos meus colegas, é, professor Vladimir, professor Tagore, professora Débora, é uma honra incrível é, ter vocês aqui é, no, no, nesse projeto da nossa universidade. É, agradeço o apoio da professora Maria Helena, que está nos assistindo, encantada com a participação de todos. É, sem o instituto dela, o maravilhoso instituto, a gente não conseguiria fazer esse projeto da forma como está sendo feito. É, eu espero vocês na semana que vem, quarta-feira que vem, com uma, uma outra grande palestra de um grande professor europeu, não vou adiantar ainda, vou fazer surpresa, mas em breve vocês terão aí todos os dados. É, um abraço grande a todos e até semana que vem.